As the perimeter of our knowledge grows, so does our ignorance. And boy, I've made some bloopers. Eight months ago, did a full tutorial on FabFilter Prowl 2, how I use it, and there were so many things wrong with it that six months later, I found out exactly how the attack parameter works in it. I did another video, it was actually very correct. Um, and then now, two months later, I'm like, you know what, I need to go through every single parameter objectively to understand what is actually going on behind the hood. And I'm doing that because number one, I can. And number two, in the process of it, it was really rewarding because I actually figured out this really cool technique you can use for stem mastering or exporting your stems from mixes using FabFilter Prowl 2. Um, and I'll show you that in this video at this time marker. But to get started, let's just go through over every single setting, decode it, get under the hood. If you like these sort of videos, hit the like button, share this with your friends, subscribe to the channel and Let's get started. So first things first, you have a mix, you want it louder, you put a limiter on, you drive the gain up, there's a threshold at the top, it'll stop it from going over zero. So you can drive that signal and limit it one to infinity at the top. Okay, that's what this gain slider is. There's there's no science behind it. It's, it's simply input up, linear fashion, one decibel up here is one decibel into the ceiling. And then you've got an infinity set ratio at the top as a limiter, as a downward compressor at one to infinity, which is technically a limiter. Now, what are the main actual functions we're using with FabFilter Prowl 2? As in what parameters are we most adjusting to affect the sound? Now, typically with limiters, it's your release time. If they've got an attack time, it's attack time and look ahead. Now in FabFilter Prowl 2, the attack and release time have a very unique way of interacting with one another. Very, very unique, very unique. So what I've got here is an attack time of one second, a release time of one second. Now let's look at the gain reduction meter on this and see if we're actually getting a release time of one second. Ooh, we're not. Okay, well, I expected that. That's why I actually did this. It's because this attack time isn't necessarily how long the compressor is going to take to attack. It's actually a threshold for the length of a transient that it will clip before enabling the release time to engage. Now, each of these beeps on and off are 300 milliseconds long, and my attack time is one whole second. What happens if I drop this down to let's say 100 milliseconds, which is much shorter than the duration of each of these transients. Would you look at that? I'm getting one second release times. And then as I open up this attack and we start to pass the threshold of that, of that um, 300 milliseconds, we're back down to instantaneous clipping. On, off, just clip, clip, and then we'll pull this back down and we back outside of the threshold and the full release stage is engaged. So that's how the attack and release interact with one another with some of these styles inside FabFilter Pro Hour 2, most namely transparent, punchy, all round and dynamic. Um, those functions which use soft clipping or hard clipping at the top um, enable this attack function to the slower it is, that first stage will go, well, if your transient is smaller than this attack time, just clip it. Don't worry about limiting it or using a release. If it's longer, enable the release function to release at the set release time. Okay, whereas the way the look ahead function works, it's actually an offset for the attack. So basically what the look ahead is doing, it's basically saying, hey, we're gonna look ahead X amount of milliseconds. If a transient's coming in, we're not gonna clip it anymore. We're not gonna consider this attack stage as clipping. We're just gonna attenuate the game before we get there. And then we're going to allow the release time to still interact with the attack time as we dictated. If the transient is shorter than the attack time, we're not going to engage the release. But if it's longer, we will engage it. Take a look at this. So that's clipping. It's not clipping anymore, but the attack time is still longer than the overall transient time. And because of that, the release time isn't getting engaged. But if I bring this attack time down, now we have the release time engaged. So these three functions all interact in a really interesting way. So with look ahead at zero milliseconds, you have a very functional clipper. Okay, so you can set that attack stage as a clipper. Um, if you want to control how much it's clipping, between zero to one milliseconds will, or even zero to like half a millisecond will will enable you to control how much clipping is actually getting blended in. Um, and that release stage is only enabled if the transients are longer than the given attack time. 
So that's those first three parameters done for you. It's very convoluted, but once you understand it, it helps a lot. So the way I got this test set up is I've got two mono signals, one on the left, one on the right. The one on the left steps up and then steps back down. The one on the right is a constant sine wave. Okay, so we can assess how we how this channel linking actually interacts with the signal. At what, because this is all in percentages. What does percentage even mean in audio? We don't measure things in X percent. We use decibels, we use frequencies, we use ratios. Percent is like, I'm not really sure what that's meant to mean. So with this, if I pass audio signal through here and the channel links, the release time technically, because I got the attack time all the way down, so we're just looking at release now, is at 0%. The right channel, which is this level meter here, should not move from 15, negative 15 RMS. Let's have a look. Doesn't move one bit. That is exactly as it should perform. Now, what happens if I bring the release up to 50%? Nothing. Hmm. Now this is an issue I had throughout testing these channel linkings where with all the styles at 50%, the opposing channel still was unlinked. It would not compress. And I'm not sure why that is or if there's any nuance to when you're using different signals going through it. But basically at 50%, nothing on that right channel. Well, what happens if we go to 70%? Let's have a look here. Oh, we did get a little bit there. So 70% brought that signal down by 2.2 decibels. Interesting. And that is about 50% of the 5.1 decibels of attenuation the main signal is actually getting. So the overall limiting is doing negative 5.1 and on the right hand side, I'm losing 2.1 decibels there. Interesting. That's quite interesting. Well, what about at 100%? If these are both linked, my RMS should go down to about negative 20. Let's see. It does. Okay. So it's almost like from 50 to 100% is really your range with the release. That, that was a really weird thing I found because from 0 to 50, I couldn't get this right meter to budge with the channel linking, and I don't know why. Now, let's get rid of the release mode, and let's just use the attack mode. Let's see if it's similar in that sense with the attack mode. So let's go channel linking 50%, see if we get anything on the right channel, and I know it meters exactly the same. Nothing. But transient at 70%. There we go, we're getting a similar result. Maybe not as, as much game reduction as before, but still we're getting something and at 100%, we might get all the way back down. Let's have a look. Interesting, not as much, but it's still definitely giving more guspa to whatever's going on there. And I think that's because I have the look ahead enabled. If I drop that look ahead, no, still the same amount, but nonetheless, the channel linking is really only effective from 50 to 100%. Anything below on this test, it's doing absolutely nothing. However, I wanted to show you some really unique aspects of this sort of test because I printed out some signals, okay? So that's the left and this is the right channel linked because that's what's, this is what gets interesting. Okay, let's bring this down. The modern mode created this sort of inverse release and attack based on the channel linking. So in modern mode, the algorithm actually shows, so you can see here, it is a very, very slow, super slow attack. So it hits and it's slowly reducing gain, very, very slowly reducing gain. And then with uh, the channel linking on the release stage. So that's the attack stage. On the attack stage, super, super slow attack on the on the channel linking. And on the release stage, super, super slow release. It completely cuts off and then it's super, super slow release. I found that very unique and very weird. I'm not sure why the modern mode does that. That's this, um, we'll get into modes shortly, but that's that style here, modern, okay? It does this really weird thing. But anyway, now we understand the fundamentals of how look ahead, attack, release, the transient stage and the release stage all interact with one another. But there's a little key aspect we've missed out here. 
the style. And the style, my God, is it a very, very peculiar sort of thing. I would ran some tests here, but I'm going to take it over to Plugin Doctor because it gets really mighty weird when we start messing with styles. So what I've got here is Fab Filter Pro L2 set up. And I've got the attack release and look ahead completely set to zero. And there's a reason why I did that. And that is because on this step up, step down, which is similar to the test we did before, there are offsets. So release offset. So this timing here for release, which offset the signal based on the style. So you can have zero release and technically in transparent mode, you still have a hundred, about a hundred milliseconds till it gets to unity gain, okay? Which, if, if we remember from our past video on advanced time calculations, it takes about four to five revolutions of the time bound, f how, how does it, how, what was it again? See, and this is what I mean, you have to learn, okay? So it's got about preset in the transparent mode. It has about 140 milliseconds till it returns to unity gain. Now, one t time domain revolution, okay, is about, 60, 33%, so 33% of what that final, of returning back to unity gain, because it takes about uh, four to five revolutions of that setting. So what's actually happening here is, okay, well it's about 140 seconds, if we look at that meter there, 140 sec milliseconds to get to unity gain, uh, one fifth of 140 milliseconds, uh, let's just say, is about around 27 to 30 milliseconds. Okay, that's there. Now, if we open up this release stage slowly, let's add another 30 milliseconds to it. Should reach unity gain at about 200. That's about right. Six, yeah, a little bit longer, actually. Let's just back out there. I think it should be longer. Uh, two, two, 240, 250. Yep, so I was right there. So it's about 27 to 30 milliseconds release preset on the transparent. But look at this, as we go through different modes, they've got different release shapes, okay? So diff different speed in which they release and different lengths of time. So the transparent one's the quickest of the lot. The punchy one's a little bit more linear in its response. The dynamic one, similar, it's very, very, very punchy. It comes straight back up. The all-round one, pretty much has no release time. It's just on and off. So you can set your own release time based on what you want. The aggressive mode, similar to the transparent mode, I don't think it's as, it might actually be quicker by the look of it. Uh, so that's there. Let's just quickly dial back to the transparent. Okay, it's actually much more quicker than the transparent mode, that release stage. The modern, the modern is super slow. That, that, that bows out to over 500 milliseconds, which is about like 100, 200 millisecond release. Okay, and that's, re remember, the release stage is on zero milliseconds here. This is just the offset the style puts in on that gain reduction algorithm. The bus mode, that's relatively quick. It's, it's actually a little bit delayed, but it's around 130. It's about the same as the transparent mode in terms of release stage, but it doesn't have the clipping because transparent mode will clip the signal. It does have hard clipping at the top. And the safe mode, slow, very slow. Again, like the, the, um, like the modern mode. So that's just the release times we're getting there. So, so there is an offset that's going on here. And likewise, now, if we go to, what would be the best way to do this? Let's go to harmonic analysis. Would this be the best one to do? I think maybe. There we go. Yes. Harmonic analysis. So as we bring this look ahead up, we actually reduce the amount of clipping. So transparent mode definitely has clipping. Punchy mode definitely has clipping. Dynamic mode a bit less. All round mode. And then we're going to get to some really cool modes because we're going to go into modern mode, which has much less because that's pretty inaudible. That's 70 decibels below the, or 60, 60 decibels below the nominal fundamental. So that, that's starting to get into the realm of not actually being audible, those, those, those um, harmonics. Bus mode completely inaudible. And then safe mode, again, no harmonics, there's no clipping happening at all. So if we head up to transparent mode, what we can actually do is we can control how hard, like we did before when we were interacting with the look ahead attack and release times, 
how hard those harmonics from the clipping actually come in. And you can see them drop off very quickly, just even with half a millisecond, especially that brightness at the top end. Um, and that actually probably leads us to a good discussion next, which is another parameter in FabFilter Pro L2. We'll go, we'll run a sine wave signal of four kilohertz through here, okay? And what we're gonna see is we're gonna see this, these sort of frequencies folding back because four kilohertz is the fundamental frequency. Why is there a frequency all the way at 100 hertz down there? Well, we've spoken about this before. I'll continue to bring it up because I think it's really important. It's oversampling. So what's actually happening is those harmonics are falling outside the bandwidth of the given sample rate. And what's actually happening is we're not getting those harmonics. It's just being folded back as aliasing distortion. So let's get the oversampling on. And as soon as we go four times oversampling, we remove enough of that intermodulation distortion that this would work in a practical application because underneath the fundamental frequency, a human hearing can hear noise about 40 to 60 decibels below that. I think you're pushing it to say you can hear noise 80 decibels underneath a nominal signal. Um, so this is, this is a good starting point. Typically I'm running between four to eight. Eight is just phenomenal. But again, like you're all the way down there. If your computer can't handle the CPU, my one's even lagging up a bit here because I've got so much stuff open. You know, four times oversampling is more than enough. Two times oversampling, I think you can you can actually get away with it, but the problem is we're only sitting at four kilohertz now. If we go up to 15 kilohertz, where we really start to get some harmonics, you can see it's it gets a little bit dicey. There are some frequencies there, 60 decibels, within 60 decibel range of that nominal frequency. So if we go oversampling times four, we're pretty clear that, and that's good. So that's how oversampling works, and that covers another feature in FabFilter Pro L2, which is really good. Um, so yeah, let's keep moving through, because there's there's a lot a lot to debunk in here, or a lot to go through. How much time do I have on my meter there? 26 minutes, and I'm going to get to a meeting. So I'm going to cut it off there, and then we're going to jump back into it after I get out to this meeting. I'm going to head out to Collingwood, have a nice lunch. Wait, maybe we can do like a little vlog thing. And I'm like, hey, catching up with someone. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not, not sort of like that. Maybe I am. Can I be like that today? I don't know. Let's just turn off this gear, shut down, head out, get back. Because um, i got to get to this. All right, let's get this last part done. Start recording this bad boy. Where do we leave off? It's like, oh yeah, we're doing this. Now we can move on to... Oh, the metering, the metering, the metering. All right, we're back. And this is the juicy part. The part that I said, remember at the start of the video, it was worth me going through all these parameters and decoding it because I found this little nugget, which I'm going to end up using when I do either stem mastering or exporting mix buses where I have the limiter on. It's so good. So it's a sidechain feature and some people might know about this. So basically in FabFilter Pro 2, there's a little button here and you click that and whatever your sidechain input is triggers the limiting. And that's good for a couple of reasons. So let me just quickly play you this mix with no limiting on and then play you the stems with no limiting on. We'll null test to show how close they are because they're pretty close. They're not quite spot on, but they're close enough for the, the purpose of this test. So let's have a listen. It's pretty much nulled, okay? Nulled. As close as you're going to get, okay? So let's do this. I've got the gain set to nine here. We'll play before, we'll play the stems, and they're just pretty much spot on as they should be. And this is important for a very specific reason. Pretty much identical. Now, why would you want to do this? Well, the first thing is if you're stem mastering and you really want to drive the shit out of each stem and get them all to fit in like a jigsaw puzzle and crank the shit out of the overall loudness, you can do that with this. The second reason is when you're mixing, let's say you have FabFilter Pro L2 on your 
master bus and it's just it might not necessarily be limiting for overall loudness but it's just giving a particular certain effect to the overall mix you don't have to lose that effect on the stems because you can side chain input each of those each of those limiters to act the same way as though it did on the full mix so if you export let's say stem stem outs for um at the end of a production for a mixing engineer to work with or whatever it might be and you have FabFilter Prowl 2 on and you want it to be acting the same way for each of the stems as it did on the mix bus, you can set up this sidechain input, which is just simply adding this button here and making sure it's keyed in to the output of your full mix. How good is that? I, I'm really like happy about that sidechain one. That was the sort of gem, and you've probably seen people do it, but for me, it's sort of like I knew that it had a sidechain function. I didn't really know how to work it, and now I do, and that's... That's your gem, like from this full video, that's probably one of the things that I'm so most proud to go, hey, this is a really practical, good, out of the box, you can just start using this and understanding it. Um, now onto the next stuff. What else have we got lined up for this decoding video? We've done sidechain. Unity gain is a good one. I don't use it though. Like I get it why it's there, but um, so unity gain, there's this button here. Shouldn't be so like blase about these more fluffier functions, but unity gain is this one-to-one. -one. So basically it level matches it. So when you bypass, you're getting a level match version to listen back to. That's pretty self-explanatory. Um, outside of one-to-one, -one, there's these headphones. So you can listen to the null signal. So the, what it's actually taking away or compressing or whatever it's doing. So I'll play that for you now. And so you can hear what it sounds like. I'm going to be honest, there's not really much utility in that. Like, I didn't see much utility in auditioning the null. Either you're listening to it and you're listening to a level match or you understand your monitoring, you should be able to hear what it's doing. Um, the null, I don't understand the utility. Why you click over it just to hear a few little peaks pop out? It's like, cool, that's nice, but whatever, I guess. Um, next, limiting styles. We went over them. True peak limiting. Actually, that's what I wanted to do on this 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 um, master here. Let's uh, piss that off. Get this here. True peak limiting on. And then this one, we're going to have true peak limiting off. I want to do a blind AB of true peak limiting. Because I, honestly, whenever I've dialed it in, so true peak limiting basically means this signal will not go over the ceiling. Whatever the ceiling is, if it's negative 0 0.2, none of the intersample peaks will go over that. Because what it will actually do is it'll just pull the samples down around those intersample peaks to make sure it doesn't go over that, that threshold. However, for me, where are we? Uh, blind test. There we are. Blind test. Um, for me, I've never liked the sound of it. I've always found it very, like... Yeah, it's doing what it's meant to. You're not going over that threshold, but it doesn't sound as good. So what we're going to do is this one's going to be called True Peak. This one is going to be called No True Peak. Okay, there we go. How's that for a bit of wordplay? So True Peak is off on that one. True Peak is on that one. We'll get the blind tester up. Solo both of these. I reckon I'm going to pick this out. It's, it's pretty bloody heavy, the amount of compression it's doing. So I should be able to pick out if it's um if it's got any true peak limiting. Let's see, because I honestly reckon whenever I'm mastering, I always go it sounds shit. But let's just see if it's biased. So we're doing a double blind test here. Let's go. One out of one. Let's do it again. I love doing these because, fuck, when I'm right, I'm right. When I'm wrong, mate, it's shame. I have to hang my head. It's no good. See what I mean? Hang your head in shame, Nick. That's that's disgusting that you got that wrong. See, I, and I'm pretty sure of myself, but the tests matter. That's two 
two out of three, that is not discernible. We, we have to get to 10. I want to get majority out of 10, like a vast majority, like seven or eight out of 10, I'm happy. So two out of three. We're two out of four. This isn't looking good for me. Not at all. I'm getting it wrong more than I'm getting it right. So here's what I'm gonna say about the True Peak. The True Peak limit is actually really fucking good. Even though every time I've used it, I've just said, hey, I don't like this True Peak. This True Peak is no good, this True Peak limiter. I'm actually getting it wrong more than I'm getting it right. So there you go. That True Peak limit is actually, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that because I'm not able to discern it. So maybe I'm talking out of my ass when, I, when I've been doing it in the past. No good. All right, let's keep going through this. So True Peak Limiter works pretty well based on those tests. Still in practice, I hold to my, my testimony where I've used it and I haven't liked what I've been hearing. Um, so even in a blind test, I couldn't pick it out. I don't know what's going on with my ears there, but you know, that's something to be said about that. All right, the next thing is the metering. Okay, um, so default it's at negative 48, and I actually didn't find this out till I started looking through it. There are other metering options. The K options are interesting if you're mixing, it makes sense, sort of. Um, the loudness one, I get, uh, but again, the utility of the loudness one is like, just got streaming numbers and LUFS. The, the thing, the, re the reason why I don't like the LUFS one is because here, so you can measure momentary, short-term, and integrated independent of one another. However, you can't monitor them together. If I go to Isotope Insight, I, I get the whole short-term, integrated, momentary, all in one bit. And that's important. But the only the fact that I have to flick, oh, I need to find out the integrated. Oh, I need to find out the momentary. Oh, I need to find out the short-term. That's annoying to me. So I don't even use this view in it. I'm typically, I typically was in negative 48. However, I found out recently negative 16 offers you a greater range of resolution from zero to eight decibels rather than zero to 24. So going here, negative 16, better resolution. So you can actually see how the limit is reacting on a more minute detail. Um, so that's one really important thing. The next thing are the sizes. So you've got the compact version. I get it. Like it, it works. You, you, you can dial in everything you need to from here. Um, I sort of like having the visual representation. So medium is where I'm at. The small mode is too small. The large mode's too large. And then you've got the full screen. And I'm like, who spends that much time just looking at a limiter to dial it in? Once you sort of get an idea of how to move around it, you dial it in and you're in the pocket and that's good enough. So we've went through a lot today on FabFilter Pro L2. I might have rushed this last bit because I'm sort of like hyped up on just being out and actually getting some fresh air from the studio. However, nonetheless, I hope this has been a valuable journey through the FabFilter Pro L2. Dr. Zeus. Good rhyme master, so am I. You know, one of a kind. One in the same, pretty much. Um, that said, I hope this has helped you. I've got two more videos coming out this week. I've got the video um, where I'm going to take you through the Dangerous Converter AD+, and I've got another video where I'm going to be breaking some bank I've um, taken screenshots of all the ads which have come to me on Instagram and I'm going to purchase all those plugins. I think there's over like 500 USD of plugins there and I'm going to get them all and see if they live up to the hype of their advertising. And and then, you know what, to be realistic, I'm just going to give all the plugins away to you guys, the subscribers, because I don't need all those plugins. Even if I like them and love them, I'm like, well, I can get another one. I'll give them to whoever's watching and commenting because you guys deserve it. And look, until next time, take care.